All right. So from the outset of the Talent First Economics Program, we were committed to amplifying the voices of individuals with lived experience, people who have faced barriers to employment or who have had difficulty engaging in a job. Now, Laura just did a fabulous job of breaking down the data, and thanks to our partners at the NC Commerce Labor and Economic Analysis Division, you're gonna hear a lot more about data in your breakout sessions. Um, and while we all can agree that data is informative, we also know that data alone does not move hearts. So we set out to find someone who would work with us to help us understand the issue from a different perspective, who could introduce us to those boots on the ground experts that aren't often invited to be in the same spaces that many of us in this room occupy, someone who could help us understand the direct impact that removing barriers to employment can have on an individual, on their family, and in their community. And we found that person, and more, in Philip Cooper. Thanks to our good friend Nathan Ramsey at the Land of Sky Regional Council in Asheville, where Philip serves as our workforce equity advocate, we were able to bring Philip on as our practitioner in residence for our Talent First Economics program. Philip is a Western uh, North Carolina native whose lifestyle went from darkness to light, and now his journey and lived experience has contributed to his unique ability to serve as a change agent implementing innovative strategies to better serve the underserved. He is co-chair of our task force, uh, provides an endless supply of energy to his work, and has become a great colleague and friend. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Philip. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Man, I, I like going behind people like uh, Captain Marvel, a.k.a. Sarah Langerhoff, uh, or, or going behind someone like Dr. Ulrich, who, who comes with these numbers. They come with this data, right? This data that talks about people that I know, whose, whose shoes I've been in before. You see, lived experience is a little bit different, right? And, and so when, when Sarah had sought me out and, and she was just saying she had heard about my story, she's been watching me and everything, you know, uh, I'm a spiritual man, so I knew that it was God that had sent Sarah to me so that I could be a voice, not the voice. Don't get it twisted, because what I, what I can't allow you to do is make me the answer, because there's a lot of people out there that have a certain experience that needs to be amplified in your respective regions. But whenever she reached out to me, I knew it was at that time that it was showtime. And it was time for me to stand up and be a voice for many people who don't know how to use their voice yet. Because, see, I'm not one to say the voiceless, you see, because people have voices. They have voices. They just use them in certain places. And they haven't, they haven't found a way to use their voice in certain rooms like this just yet. But I'm a voice for them. So when we think about this data, and when she said that, when Dr. Ulrich said that about the black males, I felt the Holy Ghost. Because I know a whole bunch of black males that want to go back to work. I know a whole bunch of them that want, that want gainful employment, meaningful employment. But when we look at the data, it, it tells us a story. It tells us something. It tells us that some people have been underconnected, disconnected, overlooked. And so this is what happened from the work that we were doing. So. Let me take you to church. <laughs> I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, if you keep doing what you always done, you're going to get what you always got. Now turn to your second favorite neighbor. And I want you to look them dead in the eyes like it's Valentine's Day. I hope y'all got y'all gifts out the way, by the way. <laughs> But I want you to turn to your other neighbor, look him dead in the eyes and say, if you keep doing what you always got, keep doing what you always done, you're going to keep getting what you always got. Now, when they invited me to, to recruit people with lived experience, that, that boots on the ground, those folks who are actually in the community, meeting with people 
man to man or woman to woman, like veteran services of the Carolinas who have certified peer support specialists that are in the community meeting with folks, giving them laptops, helping them get signed up for classes, like Inspire Recovery and Careers who have people going to the halfway houses and helping this individual understand what's available in the workforce. There's nothing wrong with washing dishes, but I know of an assembly line position at this manufacturer where you can move up. That's what we call meaningful employment. Whenever I was able to reach out to these black-led community-based organizations and say, hey, where's the gaps that you're seeing whenever they're, they're talking to the, the counselor at school and they, they, the only thing they're hearing about is a four-year college. They're not hearing anything about these short-term job trainings at the community college that lead to high-paying wages and high-demand industries. And the black, and the black leaders say, well, well we don't, we're not for sure what's going on, but we would love to have a seat at the table to talk about how we can better get the word out to the people that we serve. I knew it was God that sent Sarah Langer Hall. And so as I recruited across the whole state, <laughs> it was a beautiful thing. And when we came together for the task force in the room over the past several months, man, it, it, it's been it has been like I'm living a dream, y'all, because we've been able to be a voice for people who who didn't know that they even had a voice yet to get them included so that they can participate in the economic mainstream. You see, I remember what it was like before I got out of the penitentiary and I knew I needed to get a job because I'm one of the people, I tell the truth, I was no good at selling drugs. <laughs> I was no good, just to be clear, right? <laughs> but when I was in prison, I didn't have any other skills, but I knew I had to get a job when I got out. And so I know a lot of people like that. And when I, when I think about how important it is for a person to have meaningful work, and when I think about the experience we had getting to stay at the State View Hotel downstairs having a pep rally before the next day when we come for our Talent First Economics Task Force meeting, the excitement. Many of you in here I've seen this morning, I had to hide because I was getting so excited. I was like, I got to keep my composure. I got to keep my composure. This is what we've been waiting for. This is what we've been waiting for. The excitement, the reality check, the optimism, because the right people in the room right now, y'all, the right people in the room right now, y'all. And so with this task force, we had lived experience. With this task force, we had, we had service providers. And in this task, on this task force, my co-chair, Dr. Annie Izod, repping the NC Works. Amazing resource, right? Amazing resource for the people who are underconnected that don't have a, a credential. Come on up. Come on up, Dr. Izod. When, when I think about, yeah, yeah, give her a hand, yeah. But when I think about how important it is when the Dr. Izzards and the Philip Coopers come together, when we can talk about WIOA and we can talk about how to, how to close the opportunity gap, obtaining, obtaining the, the vital records that are needed for you to access it. Who in here is familiar with the process of WIOA and NC Works? Amazing resource. And to secure the resource, you got to have some people that might have to come alongside a person to get that ID, that Social Security card, that, that, that uh, uh, Selective Services registration, that birth certificate. And if it's somebody that just did 15 years in prison and you tell them something about a DocuSign, Docu what? <laughs> so when the Dr. Ozzy's and the Philip Coopers come together and many others across the state, it was a beautiful thing and the magic started happening, didn't it? It sure did. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, wanted to tell you a little bit about the NC Works Commission. Um, for those of you that may not know, uh, we are the State Workforce Development Board, and we have 37 members that are governor appointed. And these folks, 51% uh, represent private industry and what they need. And the other half represent education, workforce, and community leaders across the state who care about what we're talking about today. And we really follow Governor Cooper's NC Job Ready initiative. Um, we care about skills and education attainment. We want to support employer leadership. We want to know what the employers need so that we can get the folks trained who are on the sidelines into work. And we want to support local innovation all across the state. The NC Works Commission is in the Department of Commerce. And Secretary Michelle Baker Sanders is one of our valued members, and we're really lucky to have her. So 
this uh, conversation we're having today, I remember, I cannot believe it's been a year when I first talked to Sarah about this. Um, and she said, yeah, Annie, we've got this idea. Uh, we we want to get uh, folks together that are experts in the field and folks with lived experience to develop some recommendations and tactics to help those folks that are on the sidelines that have um, faced historical, systemic, uh, other barriers may be caused from the pandemic. Um, get them off the sidelines. But we want to know what they need. And we want to get the right folks together. Do you think you can help do that? Um, and I was like, that's all I want to do. <laughs> I mean, when we talk about workforce, we know there aren't enough people to, for the jobs that are out there. And we know there are people that desperately need to get in those jobs. And so what we want to do is connect the underrepresented. And uh, uh, these are the groups uh, that we really want to focus on. Uh, the disability, neurodiversity, opportunity youth, families with young children, transitioning military and their families, and justice involved. I'll probably need to sit down now because I think there's probably a, a next go. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I also want to add right now, so when you, when you see the neuro disabilities uh, and the disabilities, one thing that we, that we learned uh, working closely with vocational rehabilitation is that substance use disorder, which uh, Dr. Ulrich had mentioned about the opioid piece, you know, uh, those people who are in early recovery or, or seeking recovery, those people do fit into that neurodiversities group. So make sure you understand that as you go back to your respective regions where they're talking about opioid settlement dollars and everything. Make sure you remember that people in recovery from substance use disorder fit into that neurodiversities group. Um, and there's a lot of efforts, you know, uh, to grow the workforce. There's different organizations, you know, they're getting grants and, and people that are wanting to, to better serve the underserved. You know, equity is now a priority in the wake of George Floyd. You know, more people are starting to look at the racial disparities within certain systems and processes. And so this, this is the time, y'all. This is the time to stand up. This is the time to, to be a voice. And, and, and so, you know, the people that we're, that we're fighting for, you know, they're underdogs, Get used to just call them underdogs. You don't have to use uh, 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 any special language. Just, just say underdogs. You're fighting for the underdog. Who, who in here seen the Rocky movies? Y'all know y'all seen the Rocky movies? Who's ready for Creed 3? Anybody ready for Creed 3? Y'all ready for Creed? Look, she stood up. Absolutely. Look, she ready. <laughs> Michael B. Jordan, don't do it to him. Uh, uh, but but when, when we think about fighting for the underdogs, that's something that we can all do. It's not a complicated, it's not a complicated thing. And so when we're, when we're talking about, you know, the, the key stakeholders who are fighting for the underdogs, those key stakeholders who are fighting for the underdogs, that's probably some of y'all that's out there in the, in the audience. So don't come in here like you're, you're, you're just coming here to be educated, but I want you to also come in here with confidence knowing that you bring valuable input to the table. You might not have been able to commit to being on the, the task force, but please know, like, today is the day where you're going to hear, hear some ideas that might align with yours, and it's time for you to start coming together and building that army. Today is the day, y'all. We're talking about connecting the underconnected. You know, when you hear people talking about crime and the violence and everything that's going on, guess what one of the, the factors that contribute to all of that is? Poverty. Poverty. So, no, you're like a superhero. Look at your neighbor and say, I am a superhero. <laughs> say it like you mean it. <laughs> So we have a, a, another polling question. So pull out your app, pull out your, pull out your phone and go to the app. We have an, uh, another polling question. And so you've heard me talking about lived experience, lived experience, talking about lived experience a lot. And so when we talk about lived experience, that means you've, you've been in those shoes before, whether, you, you know, like me, I've, I've touched all five groups. Myself, I have lived experience in all five groups, but maybe you're a, a, a transitioning military and, and family. You have that experience, or maybe you're a person that's in recovery from addiction or mental health challenges, or maybe you're, you're justice involved, or maybe you're, you, you've been an opportunity youth. I was a high school dropout, you know, uh, 16 to 24, not working or going to school was an opportunity youth. Or, or maybe it's neurodiversities, and you, you have maybe a disability, a mental health challenge, or, or, or you've been a person in early recovery. And so when you open up the, um, the app, I want you to go to question number two. Do you have current or past experience as a member of one or more of the five groups? Do you have current or past experience 
That's that lived experience that we're talking about. Yeah, we could see here. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's about stopped. So we got 45% yes. Yep, and about 55% said no. So we've got a good group in here that can speak from both perspectives, I think. <clears throat> oh, it's changing. Yeah, that's why, I, that's why I chill, because I wanted to give it time, because I was sitting over there with Rick, and he was fighting with his app. I ain't mean to put him on blast. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I got to do it. Yeah, I'm going to give him some time. You see it moving still. Still. Yeah, I'm not seeing them. All right. It's moving no more. All right. So 45, 45% said yes, and 55% said no. So that, I feel like that's a good enough mix today for us to really see this as, as, as the place for us to bring everything we talked about with that, with the Talent First Economics form. I agree. Yeah, this is it. Mm -hmm. This is it. Because I didn't expect to have that, that percentage of lived experience in here. I didn't. Although if I were to answer it, um, I, you know, had young children and um, if everyone wanted to know my trajectory, I mean, it was a challenge mm -hmm. having, you know, two young children figuring out how to get daycare. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can certainly say that was a big part, even today, trying to get one to school <laughs> so I can get here on time. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everybody uh, for participating in this. Um, you're all a part of this today. Um, so I love these polling things so that we can find out sort of who's in the audience. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the task force and kind of what we did. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but for those of you in the audience, uh, we actually met four times uh, over the course of a few months. Um, and the first meeting was exciting. Mm -hmm. We all got in the same room and we kind of got into groups and really talked about what the challenges were. Um, and that's really what we did. We stayed in our sort of work groups uh, based on, um, you know, the, the, the five different experiences. Um, and then we got together. Uh, the second and third time was really getting more focused on what is it, what are the themes that we're seeing <laughs> in terms of, like, what, what's going on here? Um, and then lastly, our last time that we just met, we realized, boy, there are a lot of good cross-cutting themes here. <laughs> um, and so some of the cross-cutting themes that um, in that last meeting we really rose to the surface was making sure for all groups we're making resources more accessible and relevant to the folks. Um, create comprehensive career pathways. I hear that all the time. Um, you know, really starting uh, you know, early and carrying that through and letting folks, job seekers and those seeking education know what they are. Invest in the workforce behind the workforce. We know who we're talking about there, right? Those caregivers, those, those folks that are taking care of our children so that we can get to work. Um, and then creating uh, new funding models to make it easier for service providers. Let's make sure that the funding that is there is used for the folks that need it. Um, and then uh, you know, creating opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning among employers. Employers need to learn, how did you all work with those folks and how can I do better? Um, and lastly, co-locating those trusted service providers with workforce services. I know we do integrated service delivery. I know that we can do better. And so really just focusing on making sure that we do that. And you know, our, our goal was to have a, a set of recommendations, a set of recommendations. And, and the magic happened, like I say, when everybody came together, it was so beautiful. It was loud. <laughs> it was very loud. 
and 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 I was popping up, you know, at other tables as well. Being a practitioner and resident, you know, I was I was still popping up at other tables and just hearing the recommendations they they were having at certain tables that were sounding identical to other tables. And you all will hear more and more of that throughout the day. But um, you know what what happened? What happened in Raleigh is is something I would say it it, it was long overdue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and today, man, that's why I'm using lingo like we're superheroes. Like, y'all, listen, this is a room full of people who are talking about fighting for the underdogs. And it's Monday after the Super Bowl. You had the nice. nerve. You had the nerve to come and sacrifice your Monday. And I know how Mondays can be, right, mm. to come here and fight for the underdog. And we're going to learn more about the status of these workers here in North Carolina, learn uh, about the recommendations and tactics, and hear from, you know, task force members. Um, can you pop in other rooms? Some of y'all is probably, like, struggling to figure out which room you want to go in. You can pop up into another room if that's what you want to do. Um, so, for example, if you're, you're interested in justice involved, but you also want to know more about, you know, the neurodiversities and what was going on in that room, or maybe you're a person that's wanting to fight for more child care for the parents. I heard we were a child care desert, by the way. Anybody heard that? Yeah, we are. Anybody heard that? I heard it. That's a big deal. So you might want to pop up in that room, but if you want to go to different rooms, yes, you can. Uh, well, before we exit this room and move into those rooms he's talking about and learn about what these task forces are doing. We really want you to think about these recommendations that I just talked about and think about the fact that we want them to grow into a menu of options for individuals who need the services, employers that need the individuals, uh, nonprofits and policymakers and others uh, that they can implement as they consider the needs of our communities. Um, the Institute for Emerging Issues will actually use the feedback from today, so this is critical, uh, to publish a report that will come out in the spring. And this report, this report is going to be powerful, y'all. I'm telling you, that lived experience, those service providers, we're all together fighting for the underdog. That task force, it was such an amazing thing. You've you seen the picture they had up not too long ago, but, but speaking of the task force, for all the people that were on the task force that sacrificed time out of your day and from your families, those people that are here right now, could you please stand up? Don't just raise your hand. Stand up, those who are on the task force. Y'all stand up for me. Don't hurry up and sit down. Stand up for a second. This is a big deal. Because, see, the definition of a change agent is a person who sacrifices to fight for the underdog. And these people sacrifice time out of their busy schedules to come to Raleigh to sacrifice to, to fight for the underdog. So please give them another hand. So as we, uh, we exit out, I want you all to remember, you know, uh, contribute to the, um, the, the conversation. Uh, I want you to understand you bring your expertise, you, you bring your lived experience even as a service provider. So, so be willing to contribute to the conversations. If you're shy, come find me. I'll, I'll bring it out of you. <laughs> I promise you. Uh, but, but it's showtime, y'all. So um, time for break. And we will get everybody to their rooms. Great job. You did so awesome.